Uh, the next panel is uh, Richard Mandela, John Ward, Dr. Tom Broken, Yule Wyatt, Dr. Hiram Polk, and Bill Kasner. As they're making their way up, uh, Dick Mandela, of course, is well known as a Hall of Fame trainer and uh, had that wonderful day of uh, four wins in the Breeders' Cup uh, a few years ago. John Ward is the trainer of uh, the Kentucky Derby winner uh, uh, Monarcos and many other top class horses. He comes from a family of horsemen. Dr. Tom Broken is a prominent racetrack veterinarian uh, based in Florida. He is the current president or oncoming president of the AAP. Yule Wyatt has an interesting background. His father worked for Horatio Luro. Yuli's been around the track as a trainer, assistant trainer. He's been a racing secretary. Now he's general manager of Hollywood Park. So he has a tremendous breadth of background. Dr. Hiram Polk is a, a prominent, I, I tend to say human doctor, indicating that, as opposed to an inhuman doctor. But anyway, he's a renowned uh, uh, surgeon. He's a breeder. Uh, Seller has raised some really nice horses. Mr. Kasner is the head of Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association and Windstar Farm, and of course has a tremendous uh, recent success, ongoing success with standing horses like Distorted Humor and so forth. So I would like to start this panel. I appreciate you all uh, participating. It hasn't been many years since the Bluegrass Stakes took on a magic success as a Kentucky Derby prep because it was perfectly placed nine days before the Kentucky Derby. Today's trainers tend to speak in terms of awning as much as a month or even more between races. I'd like to ask the trainers here, uh, Mr. Mandela and Mr. Ward, in general, how long do you like to have between races and what are some factors that go into that change of, of, uh, of pattern over the last two decades? Dick? Oh, let's let John answer that one first. Okay. John? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll take it. I'm not afraid. Um, <laughs> it's gotten in the, in the last 20 years since I've started training that, that the month between races has become very fashionable. Um, if you go back to Sir Barton's day, I believe he worked a mile the day before he won the Kentucky Derby, took a, took a, plant, took a train and went to the Preakness four days later, I believe he went to Belmont within two weeks and won a prep race for the Belmont, which was within another week or two. So it's, it's pretty obvious that, that uh, things have changed a lot. Um, I, think, I think a lot of it is mental on, on the trainers and owners part, managing. Uh, I think other parts is I, I, I know from when I was a teenager, I broke a lot of yearlings. and the mental capabilities or capacity of the horse today I'd say is not as strong as what they were when I was a kid and that was in the late 60s early 70s <clears throat> and I think that that it's not just physical why we can't run them back within the month it's it's uh, because it, as Rick Arthur uh, pointed out we have some great workouts in between those races but you'll see us do that but not take them over and run them and it seems like horses are drained more out of races than they were when I started training even 30 some years ago uh, I don't know if the mental capacity again is is more delicate than it used to be I don't know if the educational process of being broken and and handled from start to finish to end up with a racing product isn't developed so that they will handle those things better um, and that's one thing that I would point out. I think a lot of the problem in this industry is lack of education on the people's part. Uh, in the, back 40 years ago, 50 years ago, people worked with horses was not uncommon. If you needed somebody at the racetrack, there were people available that had experience with horses. When you go to find somebody to work at the track nowadays, you have, you have a pretty strange group to, to pull from. And uh, I think things like Chris McCarran's Jockey School, uh, I'm involved in a project in California trying to get a school started for horsemanship uh, through Fairplex and Cal Poly. Uh, but those mistakes made in the, in the growing, growing up part are, are detrimental to the end product. And, and I know this is too long of an answer, and I apologize. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, John, you made a comment at our, uh, one of our meetings where we formulated this plan. You made a comment that really stuck with me and prompted some of these research studies. You said that you felt that the stress per start on a horse today was greater than it used to be. And I think by that, I presume you meant the preparation as well as the actual race. Can you sort of elaborate on, on, on that uh, concept? Uh, absolutely. When, when Dick was talking, I agree with everything Dick has to say, so I'll move on to another one. But, but you know, the one, the one thing we can't control, I mean, when we're training, we can, we can control speed, we can control when the horse goes to racetrack, we can control a lot of different things. I think one factor that always comes into effect now that didn't come into effect before was the health and the character of our lungs. Uh, we're very careful not to, to, to stress our lungs so we don't get bleeders. And what most of us have, uh, have bleeders and we have to manage them. Um, but the one factor I always look at is, is weight on these horses, is how much weight an animal loses after he runs. And, and that's just a matter of how much stress that a race puts on a horse. Before, I can remember at Keeneland, when I think it was Moccasin, one of them turned down the stretch and opened up about a pole on everybody and went three quarters of a mile in ten and three. Uh, you, you open up and you turn down the stretch and go in 10 and 3. I think I ran in the third grade club dinner club purse and my filly might have gone 9 and 4 and she's beaten 7 lengths. We we really got these horses. Um, uh, our, our technology has improved. We have, we have definitely, um, uh, every horse in a race is more competitive than it used to be. So I think the horse has not evolved over the last uh, 100 years. Uh, very much at all, but our training techniques and, and what we're able to get the athlete during his performance to give us has, has increased greatly. As a result of it, we're seeing more loading, more stress fractures, more problems with the skeletal uh, structure of an animal. Therefore, you know, I, I feel that we have turned the heat up on these animals and what we have to do now is recognize when they're danger signs and be able to move back away from them during the danger signs. And, and I think it's the hardest thing we're having. And I, my last statement on that is, I think we need, we, we've got the science now. And it looks, I mean, the earlier presentations were tremendous. We've got to disseminate the science down the ladder to our younger trainers, to our regular trainers, to our assistant trainers, and, and, and start giving them confidence in recognizing problems before they happen. Thank you. I'd like to turn now to Mr. Kasner, who uh, you wear several hats. One is obviously a, a owner, breeder uh, in the market. Uh, as head of TOBA, you're probably concerned with the ability to recruit people into the game. Uh, you look at these statistics, the national average of now about six starts per horse, the top 100 trainers uh, average fewer than f about four starts per horse. H how, do you, how do you balance that? Do you, do you have any conflicts in what you see happening and what you think needs to happen for, for this game to continue to recruit a lot of people? Um. Ed, absolutely. Uh, I think one of our biggest challenges right now is, uh, is the attrition rate that we have with these horses. These, these horses have become so expensive and, and the losses that the owners are incurring are, are just very disheartening. Uh, you have a new guy comes into the game and you know he's, he's all excited and he goes and he'll spend several million dollars at the sales and uh, and he'll only, he may only have um, uh, 50, 60, 65 percent of those horses that, um, that ever break their maiden. And uh, the rest of them have, have fallen by the wayside, have, uh, have, have succumbed to injuries. Uh, um, I think one of our, one of our problems is that we have, uh, we have, uh, interrupted natural selection and I think we used to select for a, for a much stronger horse. I think the economics of, of, of our day and age have, have, have changed the way, uh, the way we, we breed our horses. We, uh, uh, in, 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 an, in an earlier time, a horse had to earn its way to the breeding shed. It, it had uh, durability was certainly one of those things that was selected for stallions. 
um, stallions would, would, would run until they were five, six years old, and they would have a tremendous amount of number of starts. Citation uh, ran 39 times by the end of his three-year-old year. Um, and, you know, we had the, the economics at that time dictated that, uh, that racing was where you made your money. The second life was not uh, near as valuable at that time. Uh, as it is now, there weren't a lot of, uh, of people that sales weren't, there weren't a lot of horses that were sold, especially your, your better level horses. And uh, in, in, in our day and age, the economics now, the, the sales dictate uh, the breeding decisions. When, when matings are, are, uh, are planned, uh, one, of the, one of the big things is, is she going to give you a pretty baby? You know, is this mating going to give you a good-looking horse? Because it's a beauty contest out there. You know, the question is never asked, is this mating going to give you a more durable horse? Is this horse going to be able to, to run for, for several years? And, uh, and, of course, we all know that as soon as a horse uh, proves himself on the racetrack, he, he goes to the breeding shed. And, and every uh, filly that can't run uh, goes to the breeding shed. But it's, we, we're producing, I feel, uh, that, w that we have, uh, that we, we did reinforce natural selection at one time, and I think we are now going the other way. I think the new owner that gets into the game is, is, uh, uh, is sustaining heavy losses, uh, and, and, and we have this turnover of owners. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 I think it's a huge problem. And... Uh, uh, you know, at, at Windstar, we struggle with our, we, we're always trying to, uh, we have a, a racing program, we have a breeding program. We're always trying to keep that in the balance. But um, um, it's certainly something, it's hopefully, um, you know, the, with our new racing surfaces, that's going to change, help move that statistic up to where the owners will have a better chance of getting their horses to the races. If we can move our purses up, then that's going to certainly help the owners to, to stay encouraged. But Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Broken, uh, what, what's your uh, observation on the uh, quality of horse over the years? Uh, do you, uh, there's two questions here. One is the, the horse and the role that the veterinarian uh, routinely plays now on the racetrack. Well, as far as the... Uh the quality of horses I've seen over the years. Uh, I work at a track a situation in South Florida where we have high quality horses uh, for six months of the year and probably mid to lower quality for the other part of the year. So I see a lot of uh, variation in Kentucky breads and Florida breads. And um, there's a lot of factors in what's happened in the horse industry, but the number one factor I believe is the almighty dollar and that has really hurt us in, in the health of a horse. You wonder why that is. <clears throat> it's because I, in the early days when I first started working on the track, all the horses were usually broke in September, and they continued training all the way until they came to the racetrack sometime in May, maybe June, and then went right on, and a lot was not expected of them uh, early in that two-year-old year. It wasn't expected by the trainers, and it wasn't expected by the owners. They weren't supposed to be making a lot of money. There weren't a lot of races, really, for two-year-olds uh, that made a lot of money at that time. They used to run two-year-olds at Hialeah uh, very, very early in their careers. And um, I, can't, I can't say that uh, the whole system has changed as far as the actual horse, but I do know that the dollar thing has affected how we, how we manage that horse, how we train him, how much time he has off, the value of the land, the value of the horse, the value of everything that goes to it. The racetrack has to make money, the trainer has to make money, the owner has to make money. Everybody is concerned about the dollar and that has affected the health and welfare of the horse. As far as, uh, what was the other question? Uh, how the, the relationship of the veterinarian with the horseman, how, how much are you called upon compared to what, what it was like when you first started? I think it's uh, very similar. I mean, I think, I know there's a, a constant barrage that the old timers knew what they were doing and the young guys don't. I don't believe that at all. I think the young men are very 
qualified. I mean, some tremendous guys got great, uh, great head on their shoulders, and they're they're out to do right by the owners, and they're out to do the right thing for the horse. But it's a very competitive uh, field that they're in, and so if they don't win for six months, it's really traumatic for everybody involved, and that all goes down to the almighty dollar again. So. A lot of the pressure that's put on the horse business and the horse in the long run is due to making money. So that's a factor that I think has become a bigger factor today than it did when I first started working. Thank you. Dr. Polk, you've given a lot of thought to these things. What, what do you regard as uh, the, the, the status of the American thoroughbred? And uh, were, you, were you surprised at that statistic showing that uh, the top, top 100 trainers uh, run about four times a year per horse? Well, let me say the only thing I could probably add to this thing is a lifetime of science and scientific research in human medicine. And I suppose for those of you out here either use the product of the presentations earlier today or contribute the money that make it possible, that is absolutely first class science. I think I read every page of those 500 things that pages that Dan Fick sent out. And that's the highest quality science, the strongest statistics, the most creative thought that I've seen in any scientific thing in several years. So it's absolutely first class. The other analogy to human medicine is that this is all, when you get a big issue, it's almost always um, multifactorial in terms of the art. And there's not gonna be a solution to this issue. It's gonna be lots of things. Now the truth is you can sometimes change one thing and it'll lighten the load on the other factors. There are three or four Nobel Prizes that have been given in medicine for something that was not even true. But the truth is, if you turn around and find something that might make a difference, it would lighten the load on some of these other things. I did want to say, say one thing about the early results with the all-weather racetrack and those things. I have the pleasure of having three young surgeons who work for me. They're not so young anymore, but who played in the NFL in the era of the AstroTurf. Now between them, if I count correctly, they've got 12 hips and knees. Before age 45, six of them have had their hips and knees. Six of those 12 joints have been replaced. So we have to be careful with some of these things. They look so good, I'm sure they're a step in the right direction. But the long-term story of the artificial turf in NFL was, uh, was very hard on these young people's um, background. I did want to make one comment that speaks not so much to the volume of, of racing, but to Larry Bramlage's comment, which I thought was so important, it's a straight line relationship between prices and decrease in number of starts. And you just wonder in your heart, if it isn't some of the things that drive the prices aren't the same breeding and conformational issues that antithetical to what you might think, in fact, are responsible for the unsoundness. In other words, the prices tend to be brought by horses that may have some attractive characteristics but are intrinsically unsound. I think the issue about trainers and numbers of starts and earnings per thing is, is a subject for a long discussion, but I do think the quality of the science in that book and the things handed out is of the highest order. Thank you very much. Uh, Yuli Wyatt, uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, running a racetrack, you've been a, in various capacities where <laughs> The day-to-day -day filling of cards was a, a part of your responsibility. Now we have this uh, problem of short fields that seems to be uh, got a lot of publicity in uh, in California, especially. Where how do you how do you balance the need the desire to have full fields with the understanding that the, you've got to take care of the horse? Uh. Excuse me, I'll answer that question, Ed, hopefully, but I'd like to say something that, that has been said uh, during the morning that I think really bears repeating, and I think after everybody has seen the presentations this morning, which were excellent, and probably no one in the room knew all of those things that we were told. Some of us knew some of them, but certainly not all of them. And the I think it's so important that the people on the backside who take care of these animals are all made aware of everything we saw today, everything else that comes down the road. And, and I don't know how you effectively do that. There have been some discussions in California that on some regular basis, whether it's at uh, 
a renewal of license applications or at some point in time there, there is actually refresher courses and educational uh, material and that people are mandated to go to and and I, I'm not and don't and do not mean to deride or take anything away from anybody who's training racehorses my father trained horses I've been in this business all of my life and have done nothing else um, but the help that is out there today, which we witnessed this morning, needs to be available to everybody, and everybody needs to be given an incentive to take part in learning it. Now, to answer your question. Um, when I was a racing secretary, I used to take a lot of pride in what I considered my ability to talk people into running and as the years went by, I figured out that I was doing exactly what they wanted me to do and letting me think that I had something to do with their decisions. Um, the fine line, and I really don't think in, in this day and age that, that anybody can entice anybody to run in a race that they really do not want to participate in. Um, the, the, the old school, if you don't get, if you don't race, you're not getting stalls, is sort of gone by the wayside because people don't run as much now as they used to. So, you know, there is a final line between those who participate heavily and those that don't. I think another thing that, that's happened, there's, it seems to me, and, and, and I could be wrong, there is a more emphasis on winning today than there was in the past. Participation was part of the game in the past. Today, it's win. The competition for horses amongst trainers is intense. And there are now what we have termed super trainers, who horses gravitate to because they win races. And that's why they have so many horses, hence the term. Um, so I think some of those things um, have a tendency you know, to, to make it not so attractive to run if you don't think you can win. The complexity of that is, you know, in, in the relationship of what we're talking about today is, it, it, again, the perception is that there are so many more horses working further and faster in California between races than any place else in the country. That may or may not be true. Dr. Arthur referenced the fact that the reporting system in California is, is probably as good as it is anywhere. And maybe that adds to the perception. But it is unbelievable how hard horses train in California because of the speed aspect that Mike Smith talked about. Horses are trained because they have to be trained that hard to compete in the style of racing that's offered in California. Thank you. I'd like to go, I uh, don't mean to be hung up on this trainer statistic too much, but uh, I've been involved with panels in which trainers recently ha have said that the tendency for more information to be published, uh, the percentage of wins and so forth, does impede them. They don't want to stack up a bunch of uh, losses, and there's also a thought that uh, the uh, better analysis of racing form may be uh, uh, through Equibase and the form and the rag sheets and so forth discourages trainers from from starting uh, if they if there's an outside source that says they've got very little chance I'd like to ask the two trainers here if uh, they think if, if they ever th feel themselves being more reluctant to run a long shot than they used to and also if what they thought what they think the impact would be if trainers starts per horse was publicized, would you be proud to be known as a, a guy who started fewer times and ostensibly maybe took better care of your horses? Or would you be competitive and want to be seen as a guy who started and was in action and so forth? Can you all just discuss that, uh, the two trainers, please? Wait, I'll go first. Dick went first the last time. I, I think the, the uh, publication of percentages uh, as far as win percentages go for horsemen, you definitely look at it, you definitely flinch when you're not in the, in the percentile you want to be, your owners look at it, 
and um, and uh, it's a fact of life. It's out there. It's a percentage, but it does make a difference. As far as starting a horse goes, yeah, it makes a huge difference. I mean, I, I uh, year before last, I was down around eleven percent. I had so many young horses and saying everything developing. You you had to you had to run them. You had to forget it and go over. But it it uh, uh, you wanted to duck your head when you walked in the paddock. Um, so I took care of that. I just took care, of, took the best three quarters of my horses, put my in my name, and sent the others to the lower trainers and let them run those duds till they jumped one out of there. So it does affect what you do. Um, how you get around it, there is no way of getting around it. It is part of the modern scene. Those statistics are going to be out there regardless. Um, uh, I would comment a little bit about about. Uh, starting of horses full fields. The only this this full field factor bother, has bothered me a lot um, because let, let's look at it in in racing jurisdictions where there's state breads. There's more state breads that run lower numbers and quality of races, but there are a lot of them, so they go out there and run. Racing secretaries love them, but when at the end of the day, does a six horse quality field bring as much profit to the to everybody concerned as 12 bad state bred claimers and i think that the the blind the 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 the, the, the creed of the C, coo and the cfo of these racing companies just says we don't care what they look like whether they got orange manes and tails get them out there and let some sucker bet on them well i disagree with that thoroughly i think the quality of racing has definitely declined since field size has become an issue and and while i'm on this soapbox the the the, the, the phenomenon right now is you run maiden, A other than, non-winners of two, non-winners of three, lucky if you run non-winners of four. Then there's nothing else to do. You either run in a graded stake race, but beaten allowance races have disappeared from the face of the, of the earth because they, most of the time you only get five and six horses in a beaten allowance race, but it is one tremendous race. So you have the choice of running in a graded race or shipping out of town to a bad to a, to a uh, lower price race, which is forty thousand dollars stake, or sending the horse back to the farm or selling them. So re re full fields have led to less availability for our horses to, to run our better horses. Thank you, uh, Dick uh, Mandela. What what's your take on the uh, on the relationship of the statistics and your own uh, strategies? Uh, if I was a young trainer, I wouldn't start as many horses as I do today. I am fortunate to be in the position I am, and I don't have to worry about my job tomorrow. But uh, the media and 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 saying this, I'm not saying it's it's not good or shouldn't be there. As John said, it's part of today's world and you're not ever gonna take those percentages and those numbers back from the betters. But when you, when you walk in the paddock and you know that the TV analyst is talking about this trainer's 10% for the year and he's 5% off first time after a claim and all those things, when you go to enter your horse and you're, and you're not doing good, that enters your mind and you think, well, geez, I better not run this one. I better wait and train him some more. Consequently, you get those workouts. Um, John's got the luxury of getting through three other than maiden or claiming and maybe non-winners of four. In California, we break our maiden and we go into stakes. The, but one thing you do know is when you run in that one other than or the two other than, there's some damn good horse in there. And the fear of losing, because of these percentages and the, and the amount of attention paid to it, is on the back of our minds. And so it does, it does contribute to whether you, you run your horses as often as maybe you would. People don't tend to want to get a race in a horse anymore. When I started training, that was the, the normal thing. You got them almost ready to run, put them in. Didn't expect your best shot, but but you created something and came back another time. Those days are gone. When horses run their first time back anymore, you often see their very best uh, efforts, and it's because of the workouts and, and people trying that hard. 
Thank you. Doc, doc, excuse me, Dr. Pope. Let me um, again make a human medicine analogy right now. Some of you have heard of the issues of quality and safety in American medicine right now. And just to reinforce what Mr. Mandela and John said, I think it's really very interesting. Doctors in America are desperately afraid of having their results published. Their results and their patients for operations in this city and in this state. And uh, you need to understand that. That's something people want to hide from. You won't ever take that away. And once it gets out there, you won't have a regression back from that. One of the other things that happens in, in human medicine that's happening today is simply shining the light of day on a problem often makes it very much better. And truthfully, I've received credit for several things in my lifetime that I think I don't deserve because it was a multifactorial thing with lots of people working on a problem. Yes, the solution occurred because everybody paid attention. The earlier comment from Dr. Broken about getting everybody at every level involved in this that knows something about it is really important. One of the things that seems to be working in human medicine in the last few years, though, has not been an isolated event, a wonder drug, or a super operation. It's been a combination, what we're now calling bundles, of things that each make little bit of differences and make the horse a little safer, a little sounder, the track a little, shoe them a little better, whatever. That's what seems to be working in human medicine. The best way to get a good result is to go to a place where a combination of improved treatments in nursing, admission, operating room, post-operative care, and of course in the hands of the surgeon become really important. So it's multifactorial, but I think this bundling idea that you approach this by publishing the proceedings of this meeting, by getting this sort of stuff out to the industry as a whole, is a big part of the transparency and something you could probably welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Broken, uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the veterinary in connection to the trainer, we've heard uh, the discussions about uh, uh, reluctance, you know, sort of it goes through their minds that their percentages are down and so forth. Uh, and yet there also seems to be pressure. Uh, I would assume there's a lot of trainers who, who do want to, to, to get one more start out of a horse. What's, what's your, uh, how much are you able to uh, uh, advise a trainer uh, to give a horse time instead of uh, trying to get him to one more race. Is that something you take it upon yourself to try to do? And if so, how successful are you? Well, if I work for 50 trainers um, 25 years ago, it'd be pretty tough. But if I work for 50 trainers now, I might have 40 of them that would probably listen. Um, and whether they listen and do is another situation because there's so many factors involved. And I'd say most of the time, the trainers today are much more communicative with me than they were in the past. And I don't think it's just because I'm older and have gray hair, but I think it's just, I think they're very, very good about communicating with their veterinarians now, much better than they were in the past. And that's why I think we see a lot more things much earlier the medication thing is just, uh, you know, it, it sort of drives me crazy. And to think that, uh, just to give you an example, getting off the subject a little bit, I know everybody's a little skeptical on Lasix, but really, if you're in the, in, the, in the battle every day like I am, and these trainers are, take New York, for instance. Before they had Lasix, when a horse ran, if any owners here know this, they were treated for bleeding for three days before. They were giving medications that probably weren't helping the horse much, but they were treated and may have been treated for two three things one day and two, three things the next day, and then two, three things a day of the race, and up to some of more than that. Lasix comes along, and they give a shot of Lasix. That's it. So yes, there are some problems with Lasix, but there is tremendous benefit from Lasix. And that's the one thing the public needs to know that that is true. Butazolidin, same thing. Very reasonably priced drug. Very few side effects. Very little effect on actual lameness. I mean, it causes a little bit of maybe pleasure for the horse to feel a little bit better the night before, but you give it 24 hours before. If you take an aspirin 24 hours before you're supposed to do something, the effects are really minimal, but yet the horse is a lot more pleasurable if he has little nagging industry, injuries. But also it gets away from the use of all other drugs 
that may use for anti-inflammatories, corticosteroids. We use some corticosteroids, but we don't use even close to it with the use of butazolidin. So it's important that everybody knows that those drugs are, are, I think, a tremendous benefit, not an adverse thing whatsoever. And I know this will be very difficult to get through to a lot of people, but before decisions are made, you've got to have the right kind of communication with the right people. And I'd just like to mention the back to what you say about pressure. There's a certain amount of pressure on running a horse no matter what, but I would say the communication gap between management of a racetrack and the backside has always been poor. And they're trying to run a show, but the ones that are really running the show are the people on the backside. So they need to really communicate with them better, although everybody else thinks it should be the other way around. But all trainers want to run their horses. They all want to win, and they all want to do the best they can. And until the management realizes that, it'll never be a real nice atmosphere to work in. And today, even more because of these percentages things, uh, all the trainers, they, they look at a race and they really think that their horse could win that race. I mean, they look at that race and think, I could win it. But then when the horses come out on there, they think, well, maybe I could run second or third and that'd still be okay. So one of the things I would like to propose is that I think all entries should come about a week before the race. I think they should be out there so that trainers can adequately prepare the horse for that race better. In other words, if their horse is in a race, they can see the competition. I think that's very important. NFL teams know who they're playing a week ahead of time. They can look at the tapes. Training a horse is very difficult, but sometimes little things like that can help them as far as how's my gate position. You know, am I going to have to break out a little quicker and so on. I think the more they get that in front of time, the better it is. And, but as far as the pressure goes, uh, I don't really, I have pressure as course on the lower class horses. It's very difficult uh, to, uh, to say certain things trying to get those horses to the races. One of the things that should be mentioned, and Sue Stover can back me up on this, is that on pre-race examination of racehorses, if they find problems in that horse on a pre-race examination. Um, a lot of those horses, if you were to scratch those horses and not race them, it would be, uh, for an example, on some of the things on suspensory ligaments, they've had some, sometimes they'll find little things in suspensory ligaments. If you were to scratch all those horses, they found that a lot of the horses will run up to 36 times before anything, before they get retired from racings and so on. So it's very difficult to say, even me as a veterinarian, uh, this horse shouldn't run today. I mean, every day I have to make hundreds of decisions on whether this horse should train today, run today, not run today, run next week, run next month. Should I turn him out? Should I go to a broodmare? What should I do with him? So these are common problems you have. So the pressure is always there. And I think the better the communication is between the veterinarian, the trainer, and the owner, that's the secret. And the same with the racetrack management. I think there should be a little task force at every racetrack and you have every member of all, the jockey, the trainers, the uh, veterinarians, the racetrack veterinarian, everybody together and they should talk and talk about things and I think that's where we educate the whole public. Good. That's, Sorry that's, I talked so long. That's fine. I'd like to address now to Mr. Kasner and Mr. Wyatt uh, a thing that's occurred to me over the years. Uh, from the position of being a leadership in the industry and the position of, of the, the practical aspects of the racetrack, if, if it were a consensus that uh, we would benefit in this game by having a more durable horse, by having a horse that has more stamina, can you see a, a pressure coming from the top to reward that sort of horse more and therefore prompt his, uh, that type of horse's proliferation? from the standpoint of the idealistic and from the standpoint of the guy who's the, it's all well and good to say, but I've got to have some horses racing. So could you all just sort of batter that around? Uh, okay, I'll batter it around a little bit. <laughs> um, if I understand your question, would the racetracks be prone to, you know, write races of further distances with more money, more purse money? Uh, I, I think the, the answer is yes. I mean, we'd like to do that today. Um, 
I think most racing associations, at least those who have the opportunity to have uh, a barn area of quality horses, uh, would like to see you know races longer than three quarters of a mile on some sort of a consistent basis. Uh, for business reasons, purely. I mean, the public enjoys those races. They're handicappable. Um, so to answer your question, yes. Okay. Mr. Kasner, would you? You know, certainly uh, economics, uh, you know, drive every, every issue and every, every decision. Uh, and, and it really, uh, it, you know, you really have to look at, at, at long-term trends, I think. You know, right now, uh, we're, we're focused on breeding a, a precocious horse, a horse that will uh, get to the races quickly, uh, that will be ready for that, that three-year-old year. The three-year-old year is, is of course, uh, is, means, means everything in, in the second life of that horse. So uh, that's where, you know, of course, our, our the bulk of our classic races are. Uh, if a horse is a grade one winner in, uh, in, in their three-year-old year, then, then they made themselves a stallion. If, uh, if for some reason they miss that three-year-old year and, and they have to uh, race as an older horse, generally they have to do more uh, to, to establish themselves in that, in that breeding shed. Uh, I remember a horse named Sandpit that, that won nine grade ones, you know, and, and uh, people still wouldn't uh, breed to him, you know, for, for whatever reason. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, that our industry has evolved into where we, where we reward precociousness. Uh, uh, the excitement builds, uh, you know, for, for the classic races, for the, for the triple crown. Uh, perhaps one of the things that we, we need to do as an industry is to try and, and uh, place emphasis on, on, on durability. If we, if, we, if we start, if we create series for, for horses that uh, uh, perhaps run further distance, if we create an economic incentive, then, then, then the breeders may start changing uh, their breeding decisions. But it's going it's, it's to be a slow process and it's going to have to be a very well thought out process and and uh, and and as an industry we we have been slow to react to to the to the changing landscape of 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 our industry and of where our sports and marketing dollar is going we we we've, we've got to do something to really try and and create excitement with the fans and uh, uh, you know it's it Durability. If you're if you're asking, I, I, I don't know if, if that's going to be it's it's going to be a very very difficult thing to, to really try and uh, and and change where where our market's going right now. Thank you. Now we're going to wrap this panel up. We have one more, and we have a, a, a an hour almost to give them. So, but Mr. Mandela, you said you had another comment you'd like to make. I've been on studies like this for quite a few years, and and. Uh, as you can all see here today, there's an abundance of knowledge out there. The quality of veterinary care is excellent. The tools are there if you do your homework to take care of horses. We all do the best we can, um, but I think there's something very wrong in this industry, and, I, and that's the reason I asked to speak, because I think it's something that can be done. A lot of the things we've said here today are, are good, and, they're, and they'll maybe slowly be put in place, and maybe we'll make a difference but I think the word incentive is something that everybody in this industry needs to think of and I think the incentives in this industry are a little backwards uh, shortly on one subject I, I remember winning the Sandy to handicap a couple of years ago and I it wasn't the first thing that came to my mind it, but I walked down to the mailbox about a week later and I noticed my magazines, my trade magazines, were in the mail. And I thought to myself, well, maybe Rock Hard Tim's on the cover of the magazine. He won the Santa Anita Handicap. And I opened the magazine, and he was on the cover. He was on a little, a little small <laughs> corner. And the full page was the horse that sold for $2 million at the two-year-old sale. 
who'd worked a fast eighth of a mile with spurs on. <laughs> now think about that. We can't run in spurs. I, I don't understand why that's ever allowed, but that's enough on that subject. Again, we're not, the priorities are not being directed in the right direction. I'm going to go back to the word incentive, and I'm going to, I'm going to pick on claiming races. And I have played this game, before I say anything else, I've played this game, I've thrown the hot potato that I'm going to describe here. But with the claiming system that we have in California, a horse starts to bow a tendon just a little bit. Man's got him, just ran second for 50 or he won. Says to himself, well, I'll drop him in for 40 or 32 and I'll get rid of him. And again, I've played this game, so I'm not criticizing anybody else. There's too much of a carrot out there to get rid of that hot potato. We're not going to turn this industry upside down and take claiming races away. There's, it's too big of a foundation of our industry. I have two suggestions. One, that we experiment with some auction style races, uh, which they run in Europe and other countries where a horse runs for an auction price uh, after the race is auctioned off and can be bought by other people or the owner back. But at least you're watching the horse cool out. The very first thing I do was ask everybody in this game that, that's involved to spread the word and put the pressure that we need a rule that if a horse doesn't finish a race and get back to the unsaddling area, the, vo the claim is void. And start right there with the, with the hot potato theory that I've got a horse that's starting to break a knee, so I'll put him in for half price. Somebody will claim him. And too bad for them when that horse doesn't make the race. Saying all that, I have broken horses down myself. I had a horse break down at Del Mar this year. It's a terrible thing, and most of us try our hardest not to have that happen. And what a terrible thing it is. But if we had culpability to make the decision that that might be all right, there's no excuses for this anybody in this game. And I think that we have to support that and, and make a movement to stop claims being allowed if the horse doesn't make it back to be unsaddled. So that's something you can think about. But incentive, the whole program, you can't fill races because horses, when they're injured, I've always believed since I'm a kid that if you can find an injury when it's small, you've got a chance to fix it. Any veterinarian in this room will tell you that the first attempt to heal an injury is your best attempt. The second and third chances are they become chronic and there's no chance. They're going to come back cripples if they can make it back at all. If you took the incentive out of the claiming game, a person with a horse starting to get a problem would stop, do what's right, give it a little time, bring it back. That horse might race for three or four more years if it's a gelding or an inexpensive colt. And it, it, might, it sounds like it might stop the program a little bit, but in the long run would fill the races with longevity and horses that would keep, compete longer. Thank you very much, and thank this panel a very nice session. Thank you.